Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church Winchester's online worship service for Sunday, March 15th, 2020. Because of our call as followers of Christ to care well for the most vulnerable in our communities and congregation, we have made the hard decision to suspend corporate worship gatherings for this Sunday and the next. However, we give thanks that through the power of technology, we can continue to gather together online. Because this is an unprecedented health crisis that we are navigating without a roadmap, we thank you for the grace and support that you are offering to our church staff as we seek to fulfill our calling and our job duties remotely and in new ways. We will suspend all our programming and gatherings through the end of March, beginning on Wednesday, March 18th. We will continue to keep you updated through email and social media as we make decisions moving forward. Please know that if you are facing needs during this time, the church continues to be a place of care and aid. If you need food, we have a food pantry and volunteers who have offered to make sure the hungry are fed. If you need spiritual support or care during this time of great anxiety, stress, and potential isolation and loneliness, I'm available by phone or email to provide counseling and care. If you have been advised to self-quarantine and do not feel safe in your home environment, please email or call me directly. Your information will be kept confidential, but I can connect you with resources and help. This is a good time to encourage you, if you do not already, to follow us on Facebook, where we will be posting daily information, our worship services, and other resources that may be of interest to you and your family. We have gathered this morning to worship God. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we gather this morning as we are, anxious or angry, lonely or overwhelmed, we come to you just as we are asking for the living water that only you can provide, the living water that can quench our thirsty souls. May we be encountered and even surprised in these moments of worship by your transforming spirit that meets us where we are and sometimes where we least expect it. For we ask all these things in the name of our God with us. Amen. I'd like to take a moment to invite all of our children, wherever you are, to join me for a children's story. Think about a time that you planned to meet a friend. Maybe you were meeting at a restaurant to celebrate a birthday, at a park to soak up the afternoon sun, or they were coming to your house to share all of your toys. These are some really fun memories. Now think about a time that you were out and about and you ran into a friend unexpectedly. You pause everything you're doing to hug each other and to catch up and to share a laugh. And then you move on with your day. But that little moment makes a huge impact on your day. These unexpected times feel so good, like a bonus moment with a special person. Today in our scripture, there's a Samaritan woman going to the well. She's going alone to get water and to go home except for Jesus is also at the well. And he starts talking to the Samaritan woman. These two people would normally not talk to each other. But as they're talking to each other and Jesus tells her things about herself, she realizes who she's talking to. She realizes that she's in a special moment and she runs to go get other people to come meet him. Talk about a bonus moment with a special person. Jesus meets that woman at the well, and Jesus is always ready to meet us wherever we are. We don't need to make a plan to meet him. We don't even need to be in a good mood. When we're happy and celebrating, he's with us rejoicing. And when we're sad or uncertain or lost, he's right there by our side. Jesus meets us today as we feel hesitant and strange watching church on a screen. Boys and girls, it feels weird to be up here without you and I miss you so much. But I have comfort in knowing that Jesus is with you, 
helping you to feel brave and loved. And as we all navigate these tricky feelings these next couple of weeks, I want you to remember that Jesus is with you, and I'm thinking about you and praying for you. Amen. Hear now our scripture reading from the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Let us pray. Eternal and loving God, we find ourselves in a wilderness that we did not choose today. Navigating without a road map, the world of pandemics, school closures, sickness, and fear. We may be tempted to wonder with the Israelites, is the Lord among us or not? And yet today you remind us again and again that you are here. So help us, Lord, in the midst of uncertainty to be certain of your love. Help us, Lord, in the midst of fear to choose to live our lives out of the wellspring of your hope. Help us, Lord, in the midst of wilderness wanderings to follow you. When we are tempted to care only for ourselves, Remind us of the wilderness lessons of manna. For you sent daily bread from heaven, enough to fill hungry bellies. Bread that went bad when it was hidden or hoarded. When we are tempted to give in to fear, remind us of the lessons of water. For we know that you come to us when our souls feel dried up to offer us sweet water from a stone. You come to us when the well feels too deep for our bucket to reach, to offer us living water that is on the move. Remind us again, Lord, that you see us in our need and respond with compassion. Encourage us to do the same for our neighbors who are sick or scared in the days and weeks to come. For we ask all of these things in the name of Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, though we cannot worship together in person, our ministries continue as we reach out to the most vulnerable in our community with necessary resources and care. Your offerings continue to make a difference, so we encourage you to give today by mail or online through our online giving, or through your bank through automatic bank draft so that we can continue to provide ministries that care for the body, mind, and spirit. 
Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 15. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out from his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews did not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Friends, in the Bible, wells are sort of like single bars. Over and over, we see examples of men meeting women at the well, falling in love and eventually getting married. That's where Moses met Zipporah. That's where Jacob met Rachel. If a man talks to a woman at a well, it is either the beginning of a bad joke or the beginning of a great love story. For Jacob, seeing Rachel at the well was something like love at first sight. She drew water for his animals, and in that moment, he knew she was the one, the one he would do anything for. He would work for her father for years and years. He would be tricked into marrying her sister first. He would keep working until he was finally able to marry her many years later. And through their child, Joseph, the story of God's people would continue and progress. A simple encounter at a well became the beginning of a great love story. So when we read this story of Jesus and the woman at the well in the Gospel of John, we carry this other love story in our memories. The Gospel says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria on his way from Judea to Galilee. But that is not exactly true. In Jesus' day, there were two routes from Judea to Galilee. The first was up through the Jordan Valley. The road was smooth and relatively flat. The scenery was beautiful. The other way led through Samaria. It was rocky and mountainous and quite a trek. Even worse, it led the traveler through Samaria, that land of heretics and the unclean in the eyes of the Jews of the day. It was less traveled and a less preferable route. Jesus did not have to go that way. He chose to. He moves through Samaria and stops in Sychar at a well that had belonged to Jacob and Rachel. Long before, Jews and Samaritans had decided they couldn't be near one another, much less have a conversation. And Jesus sits down there at the well at the very hottest part of the day and waits. A woman makes her way up the hill to the well. Most women had already come early in the morning before the sun was too hot. They had gathered to draw water, trading local gossip, complaining about their husbands, sighing over their children, and relishing their friendship and camaraderie. But this woman does everything in her power to avoid that morning trek, even if it means coming at the very worst time of day to climb a mountain sweat dripping down her back, her feet sliding in her sandals. 
To her surprise, as she finally reaches the well and looks up, ready to draw her water and make her way home in peace, she sees a man waiting there. Her heart drops into the pit of her stomach. Apparently, word had gotten around, not just among the women, but even to the men. Taking a closer look, though, it's clear that she's never seen this man in town. He's a Jew and a dusty one at that. What is this kind of unwanted stranger doing here? What in the world could he want? Like a bad pickup line, Jesus asks the woman for a drink of water. She points out that their kind do not mingle and would never share a cup under normal circumstances. It's clear that she would like to simply fill her bucket and get as far away from him as possible. She doesn't need the added gossip. She doesn't need to be seen with another strange man, not to mention a Jew. But then Jesus says that if she had known who was asking for water, she would have asked him for living water instead. In the Greek, the term living water is the same as flowing water, water that is moving, water that is not stagnant. She rather sarcastically points out that he doesn't have a bucket and the well is deep. And she is pretty sure that the water at the bottom is not going anywhere. So it's going to be pretty hard for him to give her any kind of water, living, flowing, or otherwise. The woman begins to push past Jesus to continue filling her bucket, trying to ignore him and his weird attempts at conversation. But as she does, the story shifts. Jesus says, the water I offer you is living water that will permanently quench your thirst. You won't ever be thirsty again because the water I will give you will become like a bubbling stream of water inside you that will gush up into eternal life. And all of a sudden, the woman realizes, and we realize too, that we aren't talking about just any water. She says, at that point, what I find to be the most touching words in the whole story. Sir, whoever you are, whatever you want, please give me this water so that I won't ever have to come back to this place again. Jesus hears the pain in the woman's voice and the entire conversation changes because Jesus knows. Jesus knows why she doesn't want to come back to this well. He knows and he tells her he knows. He knows all about the men in her life who have left her or died or just let her down. He knows that she has come to the well at noon to avoid the women who have not let her live her life in peace, pouring salt onto those already open wounds. He knows all about that, and he tells her so. He doesn't talk about her past like an accuser, and he doesn't force her to fall on her knees and grovel. He doesn't talk about sin or forgiveness. He just tells her, I know. I know all about it. Of course you want living water. Of course you are thirsty. Your life has dried up under you, and even coming to the well is a burden and a reminder of all that hurt. I know all about it. I've come to offer you a new life, one of gushing water and overflowing cups. Believe me. And she does. Around that time, the disciples show up, finally dragging themselves up the hill after going into town to try to find food and drink. And they wondered to themselves how in the world they had gotten stuck in Samaria, wherein there was a perfectly good road through the valley. Dusty, tired, and out of sorts, they look up the hill and see Jesus speaking to this Samaritan woman. And the gospel says that they are astonished. As a matter of fact, they are teetering on the fine line between astonished and offended. Jesus was once again going off script. By all normal standards of societal propriety, he was way out of bounds. Maybe they overheard Jesus' conversation with the woman as they approached. 
For after realizing that he is the first person in forever that truly sees and accepts her, the woman has moved on to ask Jesus about the split between the Samaritans and the Jews. Who is right, she wonders. Surely this man with his perceptive abilities and powerful prophetic words can answer her deepest questions. As his disciples approach, they hear the end of the conversation, and Jesus says to the woman again, I know. I know all about it. I know that men aren't supposed to talk to women the way I'm talking to you now. I know that Jews aren't supposed to talk to Samaritans. I know that you have been shut out of society and friendship because of the path your life has taken. I know all about those boundaries that people have drawn around one another's lives. But I am here to knock those barriers down. They don't matter to me because they don't matter to God. The disciples rush forward to figure out how to help. Surely Jesus needs food. Maybe he's talking crazy because he's hungry or maybe he's thirsty. Talk like that can get you locked up or worse. They're astonished and scared. But Jesus puts them at ease, reminding them that they don't understand the whole story. They don't see the whole picture, but he does. And as they sit down to listen, they watch. As the woman who had met and talked with Jesus begins to back away from the well. She turns around, leaving her bucket behind and begins walking quickly and then running down the hill, back into town, back to the homes of all those people who had looked down on her or ignored her or met at the well to talk about her. And she begins to shout and speak to those people who for so long had made her feel invisible. And finally, she speaks and claims this new life. There's this spirit that is bubbling up inside of her that she can't lock away anymore. The living water has taken hold. The boundaries have been crossed and the walls have been knocked down. And so before she has even completely come to terms with her own faith, and before she has worked out all the answers, she is back there in her hometown, calling out to the people who she had avoided for so long. She becomes an evangelist. This outcast, this outsider, this woman. And she says, come and see, come and see, there is a man who has told me everything I have ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? Just like the story of Jacob and Rachel at the well, the story we find today is a love story too. And yet this love story is not a simple boy meets girl, starry-eyed fairy tale. Instead, this is a love story rooted firmly in reality. This is a story about a God who knows us completely, fully. A God who can tell us everything we have ever done and loves us despite it all. This is a story about a God who loves the world and all of humanity so completely and fully that the boundaries and divisions we've placed great importance in seem to melt away in the light of his love and grace. For some of us today, we might hear our own stories and the story of the woman turned witness. We might recognize the amazing grace that has transformed our lives and led us to do things that we once would have thought were impossible. Or for some of us today, we might hear our own stories in the story of the disciples, almost astonished and offended when God seems to move off the script, showing up in unexpected places and working through unlikely people. But wherever we find ourselves in the gospel story today, whether we are astonished, offended, or overwhelmed by joy, may we all hear the good news that it comes to bring us for this is a love story between God and the whole world, 
A story of reconciliation after years of alienation. A story of forgiveness after years of pain. A story of being loved into a new life. You know, people say that water always finds the lowest point. And I think maybe living water is the same. It finds us at our lowest point. As Nadia Boltz Weber says, it finds us at our original wound. And whatever your lowest point is, the living water Jesus is offering today can find you there. This living water that moves, that flows, that cannot be dammed up or kept still. This living water made up of spirit and love. Jesus is offering to us today the chance to be fully known by a God that can't be controlled. To allow our lives to be swept up in that rushing, tumbling, living water that can't be contained in a bucket or in a temple or in a sanctuary or even in one life. And as it bubbles up and overflows out of our hearts and lives, may we, like the Samaritan witness, drop our empty buckets at all the old wells and run headlong back into town, claiming the new voice and the new words that we have been given. Come and see. Oh, taste and see, come and drink this new water, come and find this new life. Come and meet our uncontainable God. Amen. Friends, it has been good to worship together even when we are not together in one place. As our benediction receive these words. May the life we have found in Christ become the gift we share with all who hunger and thirst, with all who are outcast or overlooked, with all who are wounded or afraid. Through us, may our world begin to overflow with the living water of our God. Amen.